Hello, welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Let us begin with the headlines. After meeting on the sidelines of the G20 summit, Presidents Park Geun-hye and Xi Jinping agree on stronger efforts to denuclearize North Korea and also exchange views on that. In celebration of an approaching regime anniversary and in defiance of the global community, North Korea fires three more missiles into the East Sea. South Korea's main political parties are set to deliver speeches laying out their policy goals this week at the National Assembly. First up, the ruling Senate Party's leader urged Parliament to pass pending bills and push forward with reforms. We begin with the much-anticipated South Korea-China summit today. President Park Geun-hye sat down with her Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping, meeting on the sidelines of the G20 summit. The two leaders vowed to upgrade their already highly established relations and exchange their stances on that, agreeing to continue communicating on that issue. Song ji sun has our top story. There were steps forward, but not dramatic ones, as the two inched closer to an understanding. Park called for Beijing's cooperation, stressing that this is the last chance to curb North Korea's nuclear and missile threats, and that if it weren't for those threats, there would be no reason for that. Chinese President Xi Jinping vowed to implement the UN sanctions on Pyongyang and reaffirmed Beijing's stance on a nuclear-free Korean peninsula. Park said that being able to deter North Korea's reckless nuclear provocations will contribute to peace and stability which is in the two countries' common interest. The two countries expressed concern and recognized the urgency and severity of North Korea's continued provocations. As for that, the two sides exchanged their basic stances and will follow up with further communication. President Xi, however, expressed opposition to the U.S. missile defense system being deployed to South Korea. According to China's state-run Xinhua News Agency, President Xi said, quote, mishandling the issue is not conducive to strategic stability in the region and could intensify disputes. The two sides were on the same page in terms of developing bilateral relations, with next year marking 25 years of diplomatic ties. Park said relations should be upgraded from recognizing their differences to trying to narrowing that gap. <laughs> We must take an active role to encourage global and regional peace, and we must overcome difficulties and challenges for China-Korea relations to develop on the right path. Going forward, Seoul and Beijing agreed to reinforce strategic communication on multiple channels while involving Washington in a trilateral dialogue. After having agreed to river communication on North Korean issue with Russia and now with China, President Ba will continue her call at summit with the U.S. and Japan her next stop of Laos for the ASEAN summit. Song Ji-san, Arirang News, Hangzhou. And while world leaders are gathered for the G20, North Korea fired off three ballistic missiles into the East Sea. Connie Kim sheds light on what may have motivated the insecure regime to fire away again. In defiance of the international community's calls to halt its provocations, North Korea fired three ballistic missiles into the East Sea at 12.14 p.m. on Monday, South Korea time, from Hwangju County, south of Pyongyang. Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff said the missiles are believed to be medium-range Nodong-class missiles. All three flew about 1,000 kilometers before falling into Japan's exclusive economic zone in the East Sea. The missiles on Monday were launched without a no-sail warning. The North usually alerts ships to stay off its east coast ahead of a missile firing. South Korean military authorities have slammed the provocation, calling the launch a violation of the UN Security Council resolution passed in March. Seoul has been watching closely for possible provocations from Pyongyang, as September 9th, this Friday, marks the 68th anniversary of North Korea's founding. The North has a track record of provocations around that important regime anniversary. Two years ago, it test-fired two short-range ballistic missiles. The timing of Monday's missile provocation is important to note as it coincides with the G20 summit in China, where the leaders of South Korea, the U.S., China and Russia have been discussing the upcoming deployment of the THAAD missile defense system to South Korea. 
Military authorities believe the North's missile launch on Monday is part of an armed protest to keep military tensions on the peninsula high by showing off its nuclear and missile capabilities to commemorate the regime's founding and to mark the G20 summit. Pyongyang's latest provocation comes less than two weeks after it successfully launched a ballistic missile from a submarine. Military and intelligence authorities are keeping a close eye on the advancements of the North's ballistic missile capabilities as its range becomes longer and its aim more precise. Connie Kim, Arirang News. South Korea strongly condemned the North's ballistic missile test on Monday, of course, describing it as a clear violation of the UN Security Council's resolutions that poses a threat not only to the Korean Peninsula but to neighboring countries and the international community. Seoul's Foreign Ministry spokesperson Cho Jun Hyuk stressed the launch occurred while global leaders gathered at the G20 summit where they expressed concerns over Pyongyang's nuclear and missile threats. Cho added the regime has nothing to gain through such provocations that South Korea and the international communities will to pressure Pyongyang will only grow stronger. Turning to local politics now, ruling Senri Party's leader was at center stage to address the parliament on his party's policy goals. Our Park Ji-won fills us in on the first in a series of speeches by the leaders of the main political parties marking the opening of the assembly's regular session. The leader of Korea's ruling Senri Party has laid out his party's policy goals vying to spearhead long overdue political reforms. In his first speech to the National Assembly as party leader on Monday morning, Lee jong hyun stressed the need for lawmakers to give up their privileges. I always wanted to appeal to you, my fellow lawmakers, that Parliament desperately needs to reflect on itself and be reborn to be the people's true representative. To achieve that, he suggested creating a task force this month to revamp the way parliamentary politics are conducted to ensure lawmakers truly focus on serving the people rather than themselves or their party. He also urged the opposition parties to cooperate on the passage of several pending economy-related bills, including a labor reform bill, as well as on security issues like the planned deployment to South Korea of the THAAD missile defense system. I propose that the Assembly creates a new tradition of bipartisan cooperation on matters of security, just that, cyber-terrorism, as well as security funding and other security-related bills for the sake of the country. He also made conciliatory gestures to opposition parties and Korea's southwestern Honam region for the ruling Senori Party's past political attacks and long-perceived disregard saying regionalism is fading away, citing himself as living proof, being a real Senuri lawmaker whose constituency is in the Honam region. The main opposition Minju Party's leader, Chumie, will deliver her address on Tuesday, followed by a speech by the minor opposition People's Party's interim leader on Wednesday. Park ji Arirang News. Staying at the National Assembly, political parties vowed on Monday to make the ongoing session of Parliament uh, different from the previous one, but still lawmakers got busy playing the blame game. Kim young gil tells us more. The ruling's Henry Party on Monday renewed its call for the 20th National Assembly to make this regular session productive after last week's parliamentary deadlock over the budget supplement. Our Senri party, though smaller in size now, will do its best to thoroughly carry out the upcoming government audits and to review next year's budget. We will take full responsibility in running state affairs. Floor leader Chung urged the opposition parties to cooperate in passing the four labor reform bills and a bill to promote Korea's service industry, which are aimed at creating jobs and revitalizing the economy. Chung also said it's urgent that the Assembly pass a bill on cyber terrorism to counter possible large-scale cyber attacks by North Korea. However, the main opposition Minju Party of Korea conveyed its dissatisfaction with the way President Park Geun-hye has managed state affairs. It seems President Park Geun-hye doesn't want any cooperation from the opposition parties and is running state affairs with arrogance and self-righteousness. Floor leader Wu said the president should work with the opposition bloc to overcome the economic and social challenges that South Korea now faces and not view the other parties as competitors. 
For its part, the minor opposition People's Party criticized the president for using an electronic administration system while she's abroad to finalize the appointment of two cabinet ministers. She overrode the objections of opposition lawmakers who pointed to alleged ethical lapses by the nominees. Kim young Arirang News. Korea's top financial regulator says the country will quickly implement a set of measures unveiled last month to control the nation's snowballing household debt. Kim Min-ji shares with us the message from the FSC chief. The Korean government is pulling out all the stops to tackle the nation's soaring household debt. Im Jong-yong, the head of the Financial Services Commission, vowed to quickly implement the measures put forward late last month. In August, the government laid out a plan that included controlling the housing supply to cut down on new mortgage lending, as well as tighten the leash on so-called collective loans, which have relatively lax screening requirements. Those measures came as Korea's household debt hit a record high of over 1.1 trillion U.S. dollars as of the end of June this year. For one, the financial authorities will adopt a debt service ratio screening system sometime this year, which will measure how much of a borrower's disposable income will go towards paying back principal and interest. They'll also tighten regulations on loan collateral in the non-banking sector starting next month rather than November, as well as for collective loans right away. Despite those efforts, there has been criticism of the strategy. Some say curbing the housing supply could simply cause housing prices to skyrocket in Seoul and other high-demand areas. On top of that, with concerns lingering that the country may be falling into a low growth trap, and with interest rates at a record low, analysts expect household debt to continue to rise for some time. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. The ongoing probe into the Lotte Group intensifies as prosecutors summon its founder to appear for questioning. Hwang Woo Jung has the latest in the alleged scandal for the conglomerate. He's the founder of Korea's eighth largest conglomerate. He's been at the center of a bitter family feud that cost him his position as CEO, sacked by his own son. Now, he's been charged with the aggravated tax evasion of about 550 million U.S. dollars and breach of trust. Shin kyuk the 94-year-old patriarch of Lutte Group, was issued a subpoena by the Seoul Central District Prosecutor's Office on Monday afternoon to appear before prosecutors on Wednesday. Whether he will actually answer the summons remains a question. Just last week, the South Korean court appointed a law firm as the Lutte founder's legal guardian due to what it called his diminished mental capacity only to his old age and poor health. Lotte Group's head of external affairs, So Jin Se, was also subpoenaed and appeared for questioning Monday morning. Prosecutors said they've collected much circumstantial evidence since last month that has led them to suspect So of committing aggravated breach of trust. So was expected to be questioned for alleged involvement in irregularities in the process of raising new capital for a Lotte affiliate between 2010 and 2015. Prosecutors will also probe Seo on suspicions he created slush funds for the founding family. Entering the prosecutor's office, Seo denied the allegations raised against him. There are no such slush funds. I intend to answer all questions earnestly. The prosecution has been looking into the group since June after launching full-fledged raids on its headquarters and affiliates. The investigation quickly escalated after E in one, a Lutte executive considered a key player in embezzlement at the group, was found dead late last month in an apparent suicide. Hong Wojun, Arirang News. Hanjin, Korea's once mighty shipper, applied for bankruptcy protection in the United States. This comes as the Korean government launched a special task force to deal with the possible impact on the country's maritime sector. For details, let's turn to our Kim Jong-soo. Hanjin Shipping has reportedly filed for bankruptcy protection in the U.S. at a court in Newark, New Jersey. The Wall Street Journal says the application was filed last Friday, just two days after the company applied for protection in Korean courts. But the filing will prevent creditors from seizing Hanjin's U.S. assets and block them from launching further legal action while the company undergoes restructuring in Korea. The report says the U.S. bankruptcy filing was made by Seok Tae-soo, Hanjin's inside director and foreign representative. 
The company currently operates over 60 regular lines worldwide with a fleet of 140 container or bug vessels. The Wall Street Journal says Hanjin's bankruptcy will be regarded as, quote, the largest container shipping failure in history, dwarfing all previous carrier bankruptcies. Meanwhile, the Korean government set up a special task force on Sunday to cope with potential disruptions in maritime trade and the economy as a whole caused by Hanjin's recent difficulties. According to the Financial Services Commission, Hanjin Shipping currently owes over 64 billion won, or 58 million U.S. dollars, to a combined 457 contracted companies. Hanjin's possible delays in transport and satisfying its financial obligations could create problems for their operations as well. The government task force will also instruct Hanjin Shipping to apply for prohibition of seizure orders in 43 countries to further minimize the risk of creditors taking Hanjin's vessels. It will also deploy teams to Korea's five major ports in Busan, Ulsan, Tongyang, Changwon, and Mokpo to quickly identify and respond to problems arising in the shipping sector. Kim Jong-soo, Arirang News. Moving on to some stock market action now, Korea's benchmark Kospi ended Monday with a new high for the year at a little over 2,060. That's a jump of almost 22 points or 1.07 percent from Friday's close. The gains came amid continued foreign buying of local shares following a weaker than expected increase in U.S. payrolls for last month. That data cuts the likelihood of a Fed rate hike this month. Korea's tech-heavy Kosdaq closed at 679, up about 0.4 percent, while the Korean won closed at 1,105 against the greenback, down about 12-1. That concludes our newscast for this hour. As always, thank you for watching.